Recently, Gigabyte introduced its new Z790 X-Gen motherboard lineup, designed specifically for next-generation core processors. Besides some quality-of-life improvements in Wi-Fi 7, these boards can overclock DDR5 up to 8200 MHz. And that is a very bold claim, considering most of the Z790 motherboards right now cannot overclock RAM more than 7200 MHz. In order to achieve greater speeds, you need a better motherboard, specifically designed for DDR5 overclocking like Tachyon or Apex. And all of them have only two memory slots, because that greatly improves DDR5 overclocking. And Gigabyte claims that these boards can achieve similar speeds while having four DIMM slots. So in this video, I will review this Z790 X Gen EORUS Elite Wi-Fi 7 motherboard, and I want to compare it to Z790 EORUS Non X Gen Elite and see the differences. I also want to discuss why you should stop buying high-frequency DDR5 memory kits like 7000 MHz and higher, unless, of course, you have a CPU and a board that is capable of running at that speed. Let's begin. This is Gigabyte Z790 EOS Elite X Wi-Fi 7. Let's first discuss the differences between the new X and the previous non-X Z790 EOS Elite. If you're not interested in this review, jump to the right timecode in the description. So what is the main difference between Elite and Elite X? Well, in terms of design, it's basically the same board, just a little differently looking. If you put them side by side, you will have trouble understanding which one is which, unless you look at the sign, of course. I would call the new Elite less shades of grey than the previous one. And honestly, I do not like the greyish blue color of the M.2 near the CPU of the previous Elite. So a change of color to a more neutral grey, in my opinion, is a good thing. The central M.2 radiator now has a big AR sign on it, which also looks really good. An improvement, in my opinion. The VRM radiator also has some design changes and I think also looks a little better. The VRM has also got improved and it's now even more ridiculously overkill than the previous generation. CPU is powered by dual CPU 8 pins, but trust me, one is more than enough. Just like in the previous Elite, there are four M.2 slots, each of them running at 4.0 version. The closest to the CPU uses CPU lanes, all others use chipset lanes. The CPU M.2 radiator is capable of cooling any SSD you might throw in. One of the most welcome changes is that you can install the radiator and M.2s completely without any tools. The fact that we're only getting this now in 2023 is mind-blowing. This should have been implemented years ago. I understand that most people will only install SSD once, but still this is a very welcome change. The 3M.2 radiator itself is also a big piece of aluminum, should cool down most of the SSDs you might want to install here. Another big improvement, in my opinion, is a directional Wi-Fi antenna. You can actually point it at the source of your Wi-Fi, your router or your access point and get better signal. This should have been implemented years ago. The router is usually in one place, so Wi-Fi signal should improve. This X16 graphics card slot, which is running PCI Express 5.0, is actually reinforced in some kind of a new way using zinc alloy. And you need more than 50 kilos of force to pull it out. Yes, RTX 5090 being huge is confirmed. I guess Gigabyte just wants to be sure you're not ripping your PCI Express slot out of your board when installing a huge graphics card. Good guy Gigabyte, I guess. The bottom two PCI Express slots are running version 4.0, four lanes each. And please don't try to put graphics card in there. It's not designed for that. Use the right slot for your GPU or suffer the FPS consequences. Compared to previously, there's an upgrade for the integrated sound. It's now ALC 1220. It's a decent integrated sound. There are six SATA ports, but if you use the bottom M.2, two of these SATA ports will stop working because they share the chipset lanes. The board has six 14 fan headers, three addressable RGB headers and one non-addressable RGB header, which I think is more than enough for most people. There's also RGB on the board itself, right beneath the chipset radiator. No postcode indicator, unfortunately, but at least there's LED troubleshooting indicator, which is better than nothing, I guess. Both Z790 Elites have absolutely identical back panel. The only real difference is Wi-Fi 7, but really there's six high-speed USB ports, one of them is 20 gigabit, Wi-Fi 7 and 2.5 have Geek Ethernet, which is more than enough for most. These boards came with the new UEFI interface. It is also now available on all other Gigabyte boards, but they were the ones to be released with this. I personally think it's a big improvement. The easy mode contains everything 95% of people would want to see in easy mode. You can enable XMP, enable resizable bar, modify fan curves, modify boot sequence. Basically, everything you might want is available here. I think it is now a lot more 
user friendly than it was before. But if you're like me and you mostly use advanced mode, the advanced mode also got a big improvement. In the advanced mode, it's mostly the same thing, but it's now a lot more better looking. The color choice is much better, it's a lot cleaner, I really like the changes. If you were familiar with Gigabyte BIOS before, you will have no problems adapting to these new changes. Now let's discuss the most important topic today which is DDR5, specifically DDR5 overclocking. As you might already know, DDR5 is very high frequency memory. Because of that, the signal integrity is a big problem. Motherboard manufacturers really have to design their boards properly in order to ensure DDR5 signal integrity. This is usually done by using more or better PCB layers or sometimes both. Boards like Tachyon or Apex that are specifically designed for overclocking have only two DDR5 slots. They are also designed for better DDR5 signal integrity. The overclocking limit for most Z790 boards is 7000 MHz. Most Z690 boards are incapable of doing even 7000. And you have to understand that we are discussing two sticks of DDR5. You do not want to install ever four sticks of DDR5 in any board. You are not getting any decent frequencies with four sticks of DDR5. Please make sure you're using only two sticks of DDR5 only go for sticks if you're desperate. You might be wondering, how do one achieve such huge DDR5 speeds like 8000 MHz or more? Well, the stars kind of have to align for this. Decent board, a decent CPU, specifically the memory controller in your CPU, and you need decent sticks of RAM. Only, and only if you comply with all of these three requirements, you will be able to run your memory faster than, let's say, 7400 MHz. You're probably now thinking that all those bad reviews for high frequency memory sticks and NUAC is probably from people who never understood that you actually need decent board and decent CPU in order to run these high frequency kits. People return such memory and write bad reviews while their motherboard and CPU was never capable of running at such speeds. Here's a rough estimation of what stable XMP speeds you can expect from boards and CPUs of different generations. Obviously, if you overclock manually, you can get better results, sometimes much better results. But most people only enable XMP, and if you want to be absolutely sure you get stable DRAM overclock, you should stick with these speeds. And now you probably wonder, how did Gigabyte achieve such huge DDR5 speeds in 14 board? And the answer is more and better PCB layers. The entire X-Gen lineup now has 8 PCB layers in all boards, while the previous Elite only has 6. Gigabyte also claimed they used very low loss signal PCB, which also should improve signal integrity in terms of DDR5. There is also probably some software magic and bias, but all of these hardware and software changes has allowed Gigabyte to push memory performance performance up to 8200 megahertz. But there's a huge, huge asterisk out there. This is manual overclocking. It means they took a very decent CPU with very good memory controller, very good memory kit and managed to push this memory kit up to 8200 megahertz. Do not expect anything near such performance when using XMP. But considering the previous AORS Elite could do 7200 with manual overclocking at best, this is amazing. This is actually really decent result. To check what kind of real world results can I expect from a next gen motherboard, I took a 1300K and a 1708MHz DRAM kit. The absolute most of the boards will never be able to run this memory kit, and I could not get them running on XMP. No easy 7800MHz for me. So manual overclocking it is. So I invited my friend who does paid overclocking and we spent a few nice evenings with this motherboard. The best stable overclock that we could do with my 13900K was this 7600 megahertz i ran like 20 hours of different ram stability tests and it was super solid so compared to previous elite we get like four to six hundred megahertz improvement in terms of memory overclocking 7800 was almost there but it crashed in like 30 to 40 minutes of y cruncher vst so it only required a little more stability. This could probably improve with later BIOS versions, so 7800 is definitely possible. Gigabyte also used 24 gig sticks for 8200, and I have only 16 gig sticks. So I might have achieved more if I had better RAM sticks. 8000 MHz is absolutely bootable, the system runs okay until you try to run any stress tests, and then it just crashes. The BIOS version I had when I had this board 
I could only run at 7600, which is still a big improvement compared to previous generation. So these boards do run memory a lot better. I suspect if you use Slater BIOS versions and a CPU with a better memory controller, you can achieve these 8000 MHz with manual overclocking, obviously. Interestingly, new BIOS has new overclocking presets for your RAM. Obviously, I had to try it. I have 16 GB Hynix A die sticks, and anything above 7200 did not work stably. So, those presets didn't work for me. But then again, it's early BIOS, so you can probably expect better results in the future when GB improves. But honestly, even if those presets didn't work for me, the fact that I have reached 7600 MHz is actually quite good. On a 4D motherboard, that result is actually quite exceptional. Unfortunately, I did not have more memory sticks, especially 32GB memory sticks, and couldn't test them. I really expect this generation of motherboard to have much better for sticks of RAM memory performance. I already have plans to make another video with this motherboard to run 4 sticks of RAM in it, 16 gigs and 32 gigs, and see what kind of performance we can expect. If you're interested, please leave a comment and thumbs up. So, what's the conclusion of this video? First of all, I think this whole X-Gen lineup is very interesting. 8 PCB layers, better BIOS, better everything. It's a really solid next generation Z790 board lineup. Obviously, it's going to be more expensive because they're putting more engineering, more PCB, more everything inside them. Wi-Fi 7 is also probably a little more expensive. And most importantly, I don't think you need to switch if you have a decent Z690 or Z790 motherboard. Stepping up from 7000 MHz to 8000 MHz actually has like 3 to 5% improvement. To achieve those frequencies, you need better memory sticks, better motherboard, better memory controller in your CPU. Just buy a better GPU in the first place. You will get much more FPS. But if you're building from scratch on Intel, this is actually a very decent motherboard to select for your build. I think the chances of it running like 727400 using XMP is very decent, especially when it gets a few BIOS updates. Other manufacturers will probably release similar Z790 boards with better DDR5 overclocking performance. You might even see DDR4 versions, would be very interesting to review one of those. Thank you for watching this video. I had a lot of fun reviewing this board and making this content and hopefully you are now more enlightened in terms of DDR5. As you may have noticed, English is not my native language, so I did the best I could. Any feedback and constructive criticism is appreciated and welcomed in the comment section below. If you have any DDR5 or motherboard selection questions, please also leave them in the comments below and I'll try to answer them all. And I guess I'll see you in the next one.